Um, well, thank you all for being here. And I know that many of you probably uh, don't think about the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, um, as the first privacy law to know about in the ed tech area. But I appreciate being invited here to talk about that. Um, so COPPA is a statute that was enacted in 1998. We issued our first rule, the FTC, in 1999, and we revised it in 2012. Um, I should say a little bit about the Federal Trade Commission because I assume that some of you may not know that much about us. Um, we're not the Department of Education. We don't get to talk to schools and ed tech vendors that much, but we are a uh, small agency um, and we basically regulate the entire economy <laughs> um, uh, but we typically what we're looking we have some rules such as COPPA that we enforce as well as um, unfair and deceptive trade practices and we work a lot in the privacy area um, and have brought a lot of cases um, under section 5 of the FTC Act but I'm here to talk about COPPA so the goal of COPPA um, from the Congress's standpoint was to, you know, the internet had taken hold and Congress was hearing about, um, you know, websites, it was only websites then, um, that were collecting kids' personal information, uh, marketing to them in ways that parents didn't like. Um, there was concern about, you know, potential stalking, um, kids giving out their personal information online, and so, you know, COPPA was enacted. And the idea was that parents should be notified about information collection that was happening from their kids and that would allow them to, uh, and that they should have to give consent and that that would allow them to appropriately monitor kind of what their kids were doing online. Um, so the, the basic requirement of COPPA is that operators of commercial websites and online services um, that are directed to children under age 13 or that have actual knowledge that they're collecting personal information from children under age 13 need to provide notice and obtain parental consent before collecting personal information. So there's, that seems really simple and yet it's a bit complicated. So a couple things to keep in mind, COPPA applies to commercial websites and online services. So this isn't a rule um, that is applicable to schools. I mean, I think it's good for schools to understand it because they're contracting with ed tech vendors, um, but it is a, a rule that really applies to the vendor community. Um, and another thing that I have seen in my practice is ed tech vendors who try to push off COPPA compliance onto the schools. That is really not appropriate or nor does it make any sense. COPPA really only applies to the ed tech vendors. Um, as I said, it applies to all kinds of internet services. It's not just websites, it's going to be mobile apps. Anything that connects to the web in any way, um, there could be a COPPA implication with that. So that's connected toys, it's, it's VoIP, it's mobile apps, it's um, your, you know, your Alexas. <laughs> Anything like that, um, you could have COPPA implications. And as I said, it applies to the collection of personal information. So you know, what is personal information? Um, it is, you know, it could be anything, but under COPPA, it is some very specific um, what, what is covered. So it is the kinds of things you would think, full name, your address, your telephone number, your social security number. Um, but it also includes things like, um, it also includes online contact information. That's going to be like your email address, but it's broader than that. If there is a way to communicate, uh, send direct messages through a platform, that could be online contact information. So the FTC had a case uh, recently against Musical.ly, a mobile app. And you know you could send direct messages on the app, and so that's you know that's on your username would be online contact information in that setting. It also applies to persistent identifiers, things like cookies or, or ad IDs, where they're used to track a user over time and across different websites. It applies to photos, videos, and audio files, but only where they contain a child's um, voice or their image. And lastly, the catch-all. So any information about the 
child or the child's parents that you connect to any of these other identifiers. So, um, you know, if you collect a date of birth or you collect um, information about the different websites that the child might visit and, um, or any information really about the child at all that is combined with these other identifiers, that's going to be covered. Um, a couple things to note about the word collect and how it's defined under the rule. Um, it is not just when you say you need to provide this information to sign up for an account. It also includes where it's optional. It includes where you just have an open text field and the child can put personal information in it and make it publicly available unless you have um, uh, kind of filters to, to, to uh, make sure that the child isn't putting their personal information up online. And um, it includes passive tracking. That's like looking at the persistent identifiers over time and, and creating profiles of the child. So that's what's covered. And so now I'm going to turn to sort of what that means and what you're required to do. So there, as an operator uh, of a, a website or online service that's covered, there's kind of two main things that you must do and then, and then other kind of responsibilities. So the first is to provide notice. And this is like a key part of COPPA. I think a lot of times, a lot of effort is, you know, a lot of people talk about how to get consent and we hear a lot about the, you know, all of the ways to get consent, but I think the notice is probably the most important part of COPPA, is making sure that parents um, are provided a direct notice of your information practices. Um, that's usually done at the time you're seeking consent, but in that direct notice, you need to tell your, the parent what information you're collecting, um, you need to explain how to provide consent, and you need to provide a link to your privacy policy. Um, the privacy policy needs to be linked to everywhere that you're collecting personal information on your website or online service. And um, it needs to provide you know, what you're collecting, who you're sharing it with, um, how it's being used, as well as the names of any other operators that are collecting personal information on your site. So if you have, for instance, um, a social media plugin or an ad network or um, something of that kind that is collecting personal information, you need to list, um, put their names in your privacy policy. Um, and then you need to get verifiable parental consent. And, um, and then lastly, um, the other data responsibility. So after you've provided notice and gotten consent, you also need to ensure that you are properly securing any information you're collecting from kids. You need to provide parents access to the information you've collected from kids, and you need to ensure you're not retaining that information longer than is necessary. Um, how do you get consent? It is uh, pretty straightforward, and yet not straightforward at all. <laughs> it is, um, the, the, there's just a standard. So the, the rule really doesn't say you have to use a particular method. It just says that whatever method you use, must be reasonably calculated in light of available technology to ensure that the person providing consent is the parent. Um, however, the commission has listed in the rule several methods that it has determined to meet that standard. So you don't have to use one of those methods. You can use any method you want. Um, but if you want some comfort that the commission will agree that, that your method um, meets that standard, you can use one of the you know, methods listed in the rule. There are a number of methods listed from you know, printing out a form and having your parents sign it and scanning it back to um, using a credit card, uh, to facial recognition technology, um, knowledge-based authentication. There's a number of methods that are listed in the rule. Um, there's also a way for entities to apply to the commission to have them um, to ask for the commission to opine on whether a method meets the standard so that's also an option um, so that's sort of the basics of the rule i didn't go into there's a lot of exceptions you can collect personal information um, without getting parental consent in certain circumstances i'm not going to cover that here um, but i thought now i would kind of turn to COPPA and the schools and um, give you a little history. 
So in 1999, when we issued the first rule, um, there actually, frankly, I was a little surprised by this. Um, I was just graduating from college. I just had gotten my first email account. I had barely used the internet. Um, but they, people were, you know, folks who were commenting on the rule were actually concerned about how COPPA would affect the ability of schools to have internet in, in the schools. And they raised concerns about the idea that, you know, you want to have a classroom activity where you use the internet and you don't get consent from just a couple of students in the class and how that was going to affect the ability of schools to, um, make this, you know, the internet available. And so what the um, commission said at that time in the preamble to the rule is they said, well, um, I'm just going to read it because I won't get it right. Um, they said uh, that the, the rule does not preclude schools from acting as intermediaries between operators and parents in the notice and consent process or from serving as the parent's agent in the process. Thus, where an operator is authorized by a school to collect personal information from children after providing notice to the school of the operator's collection use and disclosure practices, the operator can presume that the school's authorization is based on the school's having obtained the parent's consent. And so based on that, you know, those two sentences in the preamble um, for the next several years and, and continuing to today to some degree, um, you know, operators would get the consent of the school and, you know, assume that they had gotten the parents' consent and everything was hunky-dory. A few years ago, um, we at the commission started getting a lot of questions about this. Uh, we would get questions from parents that would say, um, you know, is this okay? Can the school really consent? I, I, you know, especially as more and more ed tech vendors were not just in the education space, where you had more, um, more and more uh, vendors who were also in the commercial space. There started to be, you'd hear from schools and parents about, you know, what can we consent to? Um, what, what is, you know, what is allowed? And then from vendors asking, you know, well, we've gotten the school's consent, you know, can, what can we do with this consent? Can we use this data for other purposes? Things of, of that nature. So um, at that time, uh, we issued some FAQs. Um, we have this part of our website, the COPPA FAQs, and we decided to, to put a little bit more information there about what we thought was appropriate. And so um, in that, we, we tried to put some kind of cabinet a bit and say that, yes, schools could provide consent on behalf of parents, act as the parent's agent, um, so long at, and, and that vendors could accept that, so long as they only collected um, the personal information for the use and benefit of the school and for no other commercial purpose. And at the same time, we reiterated, as had been said in the preamble, that all of those notices that I talked about needed to be provided to the school. And we said as a best practice, we really thought the consent should come from the school or a school district. Um, shockingly, we still get questions. <laughs> um, because there are a lot of questions here. I think that um, some we've heard from parents asking, um, well, can we have our you know, the school has consented on uh, my behalf to, um, for this vendor to collect my child's personal information, I want to have it deleted. Um, can I do that? Or we've heard um, from vendors saying, well, they've consented to, the school has consented to this personal information being collected. Um, can I use that information to improve my product? Um, can I use it to improve other products that I, I have? And so, with those questions in mind, um, with the Department of Education, the FTC hosted a workshop um, a about a year and a half ago now um, to talk about a lot of these questions. And um, you know, some of the questions we tried to address were sort of the intersection of COPPA with FERPA, which is probably the privacy law that most of you are most familiar with. Um, 
we tried to discuss you know the best methods for getting consent what parents rights should be when the school has provided consent um, those kinds of questions and I wish I was here to say and then we issued something <laughs> but we haven't um, but we are um, actively looking to issue more guidance um, hopefully in the coming months um, around some of those issues we are still sort of um, trying to explore um, you know some of these nuances I mean I I will say while I think there are some questions on the edges um, I do think COPPA is still fairly clear about you know if you're an ed tech vendor and you're working with the school you may get the consent of the school um, so long as you're only using the information you collect for that purpose um, for the school you know the use and benefit of the school you don't use the personal information for other purposes um, and you provide you know all of those notices that um, I mentioned before so I do think it's fairly clear cut um, but there are still some questions, I think, on um, the periphery that we would like to provide more guidance on and hope to do so soon. Um, but that is where things stand with COPPA and the schools. And then just to say a little bit about enforcement, um, the FTC does bring cases. We have brought um, close to 30 and we've obtained more than $15 million in civil penalties. We um, can seek $42,000 per violation. We we had a, our most recent COPPA case was, I said, against Musical.ly. We, we got a $5.7 million civil penalty there. Um, and, you know, we continue to kind of enforce the rule. Um, uh, and so that's an important part of, of what the FTC does. And then we also try to provide a lot of guidance to um, businesses. And um, so we have a business center. We have uh, something called the COPPA Six-Step Compliance Guide. Um, for vendors to use in thinking about COPPA. We also have a lot of FAQs, including um, about COPPA and the schools. Um, so that's available as well. Um, uh, thank you very much for having me.